بسیار در راستای شناسای دانشمندان ایران اعتبار و به خصوص اساتید جوان گام های موثری برداشت که حضور سخنران امروز ما منتج از این در این راه ما امیدواریم که دستاوردهای اساتید و فرهیختگان جوان جوان ما الگوی بسیار مناسبی برای نوجوانان و جوانان ما باشد. الگویی که شناساندن آنها در این زمانه که الگوهای خطرناک بسیار فراغانند بسیار ضروری است. ما با تمام توان در این راه تلاش خواهیم کرد. و امیدوارم که همکاری همه اعضا و همه ایران تباران این دیار رو داشته باشیم پس از این مقدمه قبل از این که برنامه مطابق برنامه تدوین شده پیش ببریم مطابق معمول دو خواهش اول تلفن های همراه رو لطفاً خواهش کنید یا آقای مود سرمیس بذارید و دومی که برنامه پرسش و پاسخ ما مطابق معمول با استفاده از یک فرم هست که بهتون توضیح میشه یا احتمالا ممکنه بهتون داده باشن و هر کسی که سوالی داره اسمش روی این فرم بینیسه لطفا و به مدیر و مسئول پرسش و پاسخ که خانم زشکیان هستن این رو داده کنن و ترتیب و به نوبت رسید میشه که مطرح من در اینجا از آقای مهندس زاهدی رئیس جمهوری خواهش میکنم که تشکیل بیارن و صحبت های ابتدایش رو بفرمایید. آقای مهندس بفرمایید. چیز مجددن بارزی که یک بارم تبریک ارس کردم به دردون در مراسم امروز سال جدید را به یکایی که شما عزیزان و سرداران گامی تبریک و تحلیه درز کنم امروز نیز خوشحالیم و بر خود میباریم که یکی از فرزندان برومند وطن ما میزوانش هستیم جناب دکتر عرابی به کانون گرم و مهر ما خوش آمدید چند موضوع است که من بایستی برای اطلاع برس رو برسونم خیلی سریع عرض کارم کرد ماه آینده در ماه می ما گدرین برای سخنداری نداریم ولی مجموعه عمومی داریم که خیلی مهمه در پنجم می در همین حتر برای مجموعه عمومی سالی رو نخواهیم داشت که گزارش حیرت و مدیره امور مالی و انتخاب فکر میکنم پنج نفر از اعضایی که خدمت شد دو سالشون تمام میشه مجددن تجدید کار خواهد شد حتما از اعضای مخترم پیوسته استدعان کنم هر دوری شده از حالا یک ماه قبل برشون برسونیم بودیم در برنامه بزنن تشریف بیارن چون مستحضری ما موقعی میتونیم انتخابات انجام بیدیم که نصف به اضافه یک نفر اینجا تشریف داشته تا به حال خوشبختانه هیچ وقت اتفاق نیفته که دو مرتبه تکرار بشه چون همه محقق و فهمیده و فریخته هستند من ایمان دارم که حتما تشریف خواهند آورد و من اینجا یه چیزی با برسون برسونم استدعا میکنم از محضر زیگوده و مسئلت شما حتما لطف بفرمایین این مبلغ حق وزیرت و پرداخ بفرمایین چون روز اون روز با کمان شرمندگی اگر اسماعیل زایده هم سر موقع پرداخت نکرده باشه سرکار خانم مانسرانی 
جلوش میگیره که ما اون بده و بده. پس استدعا میکنم به استدعای ما که برای همه شما به مجردی که وقت سرمی نامستیم به حبت بفرمایید اینا پرداخت فرمایید. سخنران ماه جون ما که در روز چهارشنبه دوم ماه جون در همین هتل شیطان انجام خواهد شد جناب پروفسور جعفر ارکان حامد هست استاد دانشگاه مکیر هستن که من فکر کنم خیلی از دوستان با چهره ایشون آشنا بودن جون سالیان بیا در دانشگاه سنتی استاد بودن که درباره دیستنیشن ما صحبت کردن کرد موضوعی بسیار عالی و اپ یا حتما تشکر بیارید نوروز باز من تکیه میکنم روش چون یکی از افتخارات کانون بود که این دفعه با نظم و ترتیب و اواهت خاک برگزار شد افتخار میزبانی حدود 700 نفر داشتیم در همین شرعتان هتل من باید اینجا از کلیه دوستان و عزیزانی که به نحوی از انها سپورت کردن در این موضوع تشکر و سپاسداری کنم مخصوصا من باید برشتون برسونم که رسانه های گروهی مخصوصا پیک روز که روزی از خانواده مهندس من بهشون میگم در سرمقاله روز بعد از آمدنش عکس زیبای خانم مهندس مفتاحی که اینجا با چه هنر غیر عالی برنامه انجام دادن و چه جمله عالی نوشته پیوند دلپذیر نسلها در جشن نوروزی مهندس من اگرچه وقتی تونم گرفته میشه من برای اون دی از بوستان عزیزی که این نخوندن چون واقعا این آقای دکتر تاج دولتی با دید باز بدون بیطرفی کارنامه در حقیقت چندین ساله مهندس را در این مقاله شده بشته من اگر اجازه بدید یک دو تا پاراگرافش میگونم چون من خودم واقعا افتخار میکنم که در جای خدمت گذارم که این قدر و خدماتی که انجام میشه عرج میره اکس های متعدید از مراسم برنامه که داشتیم یک صفحه مخصوص اینجا نوشته نوشته در پی برگزاری چندین جشن و مراسم نوروزی از سوی کودکان و دانش آموزان مدارس و دبیرستان های زبان فارسی در تورنتو و نیز برنامه نوروزی زنگ قدسه که گزارشه اون را در شماره گذشته پیک روز مرازی کردید در نخستین روز فروردین جشن بزرگ نوروزی دیگری در شهر تورنتو برگزار شد که باید به عنوان نقطه عطفی در سابقه فعالیت های فرنگی اجتماعی جامعه ایگانی کانادا محصوب نشه شود به همت و تلاش کانون کانادایی مهندسین و آشیتای ایرانی مهندس شنبه شب گذشته جشن بزرگ نوروزی در هتل شریتون ریچونفیل با حضور حدود 700 تر از زنان اینجا توجه بفرده زنان و مردان و جوانان و کودکان ایران ما اینجا سعی کردیم که هر چهار نسل باشه و احساس آرامش کنه و تعدادی از کانادایی‌ها برگزار شد. کانون مهندس به عنوان یکی از موفق‌ترین، کوشاترین و کوشاترین نهادهای ایرانی سابقه طولانی و درخشان در برگزاری مراسم ویژه سالانه نظیر شب یلدا، جشن نوروزی، انجام جلسات سخنرانی ماهیانه و گردش‌های علمی تفریحی دارد. اما جشن نوروزی امسال ویژگی هایی داشت که باید مورد تأکید و تمجید قرار کرد. به عنوان کسی که بارها در مراسم شبهای یلدا و جشن نوروزی کانون و هندس حضور داشتم باید از آن کنم که مراسم امسال حال هوای متفاوت داشت. جشن نوروزی امسال و هندس یک میهمانی سمیمانه خانوادگی در اندازه بزرگ بود. مراسم دیدنی بود که سه چهار نسل از ایرانیان در زیر یک سرف جمع کرده بود. تا نخستین ساعات سال ایرانی را در فضای گرم و دلپذیر آغاز کنند. گردآوری کودکان و نوباوگان ایرانی در کنار نوجوانان و جوانان و میان سالان و تعداد قابل توجهی از سالبندان ایرانی به اعتراف بسیاری از شرکت کنندگان در مراسم واقعی بود دلپذیر و از لحاظ پیوندهای عاطفی و اجتماعی در جامعه مهاجرت بسیار مهم و اثرگذار بود. با توجه به اینکه یکی از اثرات منفی زندگی در مهاجرت از هم از هم گسیختن یا سوز شدن روابط میان افراد برخی خانواده هاست اقدام کانون و مهندس در برگزاری مراسم و 
به بهانه نوروز که پیوند میان گروه های مختلف سنی ایرانیان را در فضای دلنشین و جذاب امکان پذیر ساخت شایسته می شود ویژگی دیگر جشن نوروز امسال مهندس برنامه‌ریزی دقیق و دیدنی با شرکت هنرمندان جامعه ایرانیان تورنتو بود اجرای ترانه های خاطر انگیز توسط خانم شیدا اجازیان و همراهی پیانو آقای کمال تراوتی اجرای رقص های زیبای گلاسا از رقص های خراسانی توسط مهندس آیدا مفتایی اجرای رقص زیبای آذری توسط گروه رقص و موسیقی آذربایجانی تبریز به سرپرستی رامین شاتور و کارکشی و رقص و موزیک یقینا خاطره زیبا در زیبا در یاد بسیاری از شرکتان در جشن نوروزی باقی گذاشته است جشن نوروزی امسال کانون مهندس ویژگی دیگری نیز داشت و آن اینکه اینجا توجه بفرمایید کلیه درآمد حاصل از برگزاری جشن منهای مخارج به حساب ستاد کمک رسانی و بازسازی زلزله بم واریز خواهد شد لازم به یادآوری است که کانون مهندس کلیه منافع برنامه ویژه ویژه شبیه الدار را نیز در اختیار ستاد بم قرار داده است برگزاری مراسم خاطر انگیز جشن نوروز سال 1383 به کوشش اعضای هیئت مدیره کانون مهندس آشیفتا ایرانی مهندس صورت گرفت که هیئت مدیره به اجرای خانم مهندس بهار بهزادی به شایستگی تا ساعت دو مقداد ادامه یافت محمد تاج دولتی من عذر میخوام وقتتون گرفتم چون در این نکات بسیار حساسی بود که بعضی هاش من دیگه لازم نیست برسونم برسونم چون از اون اجازه گرفته بودیم که در آمده شبیه اندا به هم بدیم دادیم و در همینجا برسونم گرسونم که ما دوستان و عزیزانی هم که مقداری پول هدیه کرده بودن به... که اسمشون هم در سایت هست هم بهشون نام خواهیم زد چکی به مبلغ نزدیک 9000 دلار به بند دادیم که فوتوکوپی چک در خبرنامه زمستانه که به زودی بیمون فاهمت ببخشید بار شروش دیگه کرد حتما ملاحظه خواهیم فرمود و این لازم بود که من برسونم یکی از کارهای دیگه که من باید برسونم برسونم که واقعا باعث افتخار کانون هست خاطر دون هست که از دو سال پیش در یکی از همین شبهای یلدا به همت قده از دوستان و مخصوصا جناب دکتر بنیجوار که خوشحالم اینجا تشریف دارن ما قرار شد بورسیه ای درست کنیم برای مهندس خوشبختانه با کمک ادعی از خود دانشجویان دانشگاه تورنتو تمام این فرم و برنامه ها انجام شد از بین کلیه شرکت کنندگان ما سه نفر انتخاب کردیم که با اجازه شما در روز که در می در ماه می برنامه مجموعه عمومی خواهیم داد تگ مراسم ویژه به این هر سه نفر عزیزان و نور چشمانمون از دانشگاه تورنتو که انتخاب شدن حتما بهشون اینجا در حضور شما چکاشون ادام کنم برای اطلاعاتون عرض بکنم این عزیزانمون اسماشون هست آقای بردیا امیر چوپانی دانشجوی سال سوم متالوژی دانشکده مهندسی دانشگاه تورنتو است خانم تینا تحمورزاده دانشجوی سال دو رشته بر هستن و خانم آذر سونا سعیدی که سال سه مهندسی شیمی خوشحالیم که یکی از اینها تینا خانم دکتر دوست و همکار و یار عزیزمون آقای مهندس تنبورزاده هستن که اینجا هستن در ساعت بینا تبریک میگیم برایشون از طرف شما ها نامه زدیم دعوت کردیم قبول فرمودن حتما در اون روز تشریف خواهند داشت با اعتمال زیاد هر جایز های هر کنون از اینها با دست تر و مبارک کسانی که بوسیا حدیه کردن اینجا بشوندیم که شما چهره های این انسان های خوب را بشناسیم هر شبه بزرگتون مهندس همیشه موفق بوده با لطف و محبت دوستان دیگه که اگر هم در حیط رو میدونی اینستان جایی دیگه هستن در همین ماه گذشته خوشبختانه به همت آقای مهندس سعید زیایی که هستن در جایی در سی سی پی ای در کانادیان کانسل آف پروفیشنال انجینیرین که مطالعه میکنه در امور چگونگی جذب کردن مهندسان و مهاجر پروژه 750 هزار جاری دارن ما خوشحالیم که برای ادویس چهار نفر از مهندسان پی این شما انتخاب شدن و اونها مصاحبه کردن و اینا نظر بدن که انشاءالله برای این مهاجرین چیکار کنن این چهار نفر هم یه اجازه دارید اسمشون حتما بیارم آقای مهندس شایان هستن آقای مهندس منصور مهدوی و آقای مهندس با وفا و خانم مهندس جعفر زده این باعث افتخاره بعد یکی از افتخاراتی دیگه اینکه 
آوازه مهندس اگه خاطرتو باشه در جلسه اون دفعه عرض کردم که ما به گروه مرز رفتیم دیدیم یک کمک هایی شده بود از طرف شما عزیزان در فیلیپین که عکس این داده بودن رو همه جا من آوردم اینجا به عرض رسوندم با آرم مهندس برای بچه هایی که اونجا لباس داشتن لباس خریده داشته بود خوشبختانه در این دفعه مجله پی انج انجینیرینگ باز مقاله است که آقای زیایی نوشته و از کانون اسم بردن و نام بردن کانون روز به روز دارد متوفی تر میشه و به روز به شما و اسم و آوازش در همه جا برده میشه هر شبت به حضور جنابالی دیگه یکی از کاری که باید من به اشتون برسونم امسال هم دفت سنوات گذشته به همت دوست و یار همیشگی کانون آقای مهندس حمیدی که امروز داره اولین بار با تصفیه جنابی میرم شون برنامه بازدید باهاره خواهیم داشت از باغ بسیار زیبای رویال بوتانی گاردن که یک از بزرگترین باقای کانادا هست حتما اطلاعیش اونجا هست محبت میکنید بردارید به وسیله روزنامه و ایمیل به عرض دونگی رسونید حیرت مدیره تصویر کرده که امسان همه با اتوبوس بریم یاد دوران دانشجویی و مدرسه بیافتیم با هم دیگه انشاءالله بریم اعلام میکنیم در یک جایی که با اتوبوس بریم من دیگه زیاد صحبت نمی کنم فقط اینجا باید امروز افتخار بکنم و خیر مختم بگم که یکی از اساطیر پر آوازمون آقای استاد نامی در اینجا تشریف دارن از دانشگاه و امیدوارم ما به تانیمیشون رو راضی کنیم که یکی از سخنانه خوب باشه من میخوام از محضر زیجود با مسررت ایشون استاد کنم با او قامت زیبا بلندشون قیام کنن که شاگرده را ایشون بشنسن به افتخار شونی دست بزنین خیلی متشکرم که خوشت سپاس دارم ایشون به زبان انگلیسی هست بنابراین در یه مدتی معرفیشون هم به انگلیسی خواهد بود از اینجا اسمیش میکنی به زبان انگلیسی تا به انتهای اسم من Seems okay. If it's not, just let me know. The point of my talk today is uh, humans, 
computers and the interaction between them. See, for decades, we've had to learn how to use technology, learn to type, learn to use the buttons in our cars, learn to use all the remotes that we have, the numerous remotes that I'm sure all of you have at home. The problem is that this has been our buttons and keys have been our only means of talking to technology. And the result is that technology has become confusing, inefficient, and in certain cases unusable. Imagine in a car, if you have to change the radio station, if you have to call home and uh, change the heat, turn the heat up. Too many things to do, it's unsafe to do in a car. But if you simply could talk to your car, if you could simply use speech, it would be a lot easier. You could simply say, put it on 103.5, turn the heat up five degrees, and call home. Much safer and easier. So my, the goal of my research and that of my students is to explore how computers can understand speech, how they can listen to us, understand what we say, and act upon it. Speech is a great interface. It's been used for millennia. It's been, through evolution, it's been optimized. It is uh, um, ideal not for every situation, but for most situations. Um, we can even talk even if there is noise. So if there was multiple conversations, which I'm glad there isn't in this room, <coughs> but even if there are, you can still understand what I said. And this is a remarkable uh, achievement for humans. Uh, computers can't do the same, and I'll show you why. The other aspect of speech is that it's wireless, meaning that I don't have to touch someone to, to talk to them. I, I can simply speak by sound waves, which is, a, again, for this talk, is a good thing. And because it's wireless, it could be placed remote controls, it could be used in cars, so a lot of, it has a lot of good traits. But now the question is, how can we make computers understand speech? And that's the, one of the major points of my talk today. So to start with, let's uh, discuss how sound is produced, recorded, and processed. As we speak, our sound waves travel through air as pressure differences. So a microphone acts as a conversion device. It takes these pressure differences and converts them into voltage values. So if we had a device that would take the voltage and show it across time, which is called an oscilloscope, you would see a voltage versus time graph. What this shows is how the voltage would change as a function of time, and this voltage tells you what the pressure difference is. So now for many applications, we want to process this, um, this signal. For example, this could include, I'll warn you, there's some audio if you're sitting close to the speakers. For example, some of the applications could include MP3 players. You might want to compress it for MP3. You might want to record this audio on a CD. Or as our application is, you might want to understand this signal that you just recorded. What word does it correspond to? What did that person say? So if you take a closer look at this, this is our voltage versus time graph. Somehow we want to process this. Somehow we want to take the information stored in this and understand what did the person say. It's not so easy to do because, as you can see here, there's, this is a very complicated curve. It's difficult to describe this in any simple terms. The first of the answer is, uh, was actually um, answered by somebody in the 19th century. Joseph Fourier, who was a good friend and advisor to Napoleon, he came up with this very simple observation. He realized that you can take any signal, any voltage versus time graph, and decompose this into a set of basic sinusoids, sin basic waves, sine functions, of different amplitudes, phases, and frequencies. But there's, no matter what function you give Joseph, there is always a set of finite sinusoids that add up to give you the signal you see here. And this is very important. Now, um, I know most of your engineers, I realize some people aren't, so let me just discuss what sinusoids are. So a sine function is just like a wave. It looks like a cross-section of a water wave. It's described as a, by amplitude, phase and frequency. The amplitude describes the height of this wave. The phase describes the starting point. And the frequency, which is one of the most important components, describes how many cycles we have per second. How many times it go up and down per second. For our ears, frequency is a very important component. It's a component that we're very susceptible to. I'll just show you what happens as we lower the frequency, meaning that we have fewer cycles per second. as we increase the frequency, meaning we have more cycles per second. So now, using 
uh, Joseph Fourier's technique, we can change our point of view. We can take any complicated, um, confusing signal and describe it in terms of a set of sinusoids with different amplitudes, different phases, thank you, and different frequencies. Now, it's much easier to look at these and try to understand what these coefficients, what these values are, than to look at the original signal. So now what we do is, uh, as music is generated, we have a microphone that converts this into a voltage. This, of course, can be observed by an oscilloscope, but yet we want to record this, so we sample and quantize, which is a way of converting these voltage values on a computer. So we get certain values, which are then sent and recorded by a computer. And then our computer can perform a Fourier transform, thereby obtaining the phases and frequencies and amplitudes of our major science units. So now, if we have a long recording, as we always do, we can take segment by segment, do a Fourier transform. Next segment, we do a second Fourier transform. And we observe what the frequencies, at different frequencies, what the corresponding amplitudes are. In fact, you can have all the frequencies listed, and some amplitudes we live would list as zero. So what we do is we um, plot this the frequencies and amplitudes in a different way. We plot them vertically, where we plot the amplitude as a function of frequency, and then depending on how much, how large the amplitude is, we make the color different. So if the amplitude, that A value is large, we use red. And if it's small, we use blue. So what this graph shows is a time, time segment versus frequency graph, showing what the dominant frequencies are, frequencies that have the highest amplitude. So you can see that there are, this is a person saying hello. You can see that in this segment, something uh, is very obvious. There are these dominant frequencies that seem to be changing slowly across time. They seem to have a shape. For example, here you can see a U shape almost. And the issue is that in the time domain, in our voltage versus time graph, every time you say the word hello, the time domain graph looks completely different. But when you look at this time frequency magnitude plot, and you say hello, and somebody else says hello, these shapes remain the same. And that is exactly how speech recognition works. Recognition systems try to find these shapes to have a training phase, and they find out what shape corresponds to which word. And every time you say a word that the system doesn't know, it will try to match it to the best known shape, and therefore finds out what word you just spoke. And that is the system that is in, if you have a recognition system in your car or cell phone or, or at home, all of those are using this exact same approach. They find time frequency shapes, they find these time frequency shapes and understand what you're saying. So speech recognition is great, as I mentioned before. It can be used for a lot of applications. One is interfacing with palm pilots, handheld computers. This device, which I'm sure you know about Palm Pilots, you've seen many of these before. Right now, we have to use handwriting recognition, which is very tedious. It's very annoying to enter information, especially a lot of information. But if you can simply speak to this device, it would make things a lot easier. We can't yet. Uh, there are other applications, including car function control and just um, interfacing with technology, with appliances, with TVs, with computers. There's a lot of applications. But we are not there yet because of noise. As soon as you have noise, as soon as you have somebody talking to your car at the same time, current recognition systems break down. They can't function as well. In fact, they can't function almost at all, depending on how much noise you have. So noise, especially speech noise, somebody else talking in the background, this happens if you have if you try to control your car with your voice, but your kids are crying in the back seat. Well, your speech recognition system isn't going to work. Even if there's a cell phone ringing, your system is not going to work because um, your recognition system is going to be confused. The, uh, the other problem is that they're too complicated. Our systems can barely run on a Pentium 4. This Palm Pilot does not have a Pentium 4. And therefore, getting the system to run on this is a very large challenge. So today I'll discuss these problems. These are the reasons that our systems, that you don't see a recognition system in your car, in your tablet computer or handheld computer, and in your home. And once these problems are solved, hopefully you'll see recognition systems in a lot more places. 
So the solution that I, I've tried to use, and some of my colleagues have used, is that we humans have two ears. Having two ears um, allows us to do a lot of interesting things. We can perform a lot of tasks that we couldn't do with a single ear, with a single microphone. So why not use more than a single microphone for computers? Use two, or four, or ten. By having multiple microphones, now we can do many interesting uh, applications, many interesting tasks, as I will show you today. So to this end, we've, um, with the help of my students, I've uh, set up a lab at the University of Toronto known as the Artificial Perception. It's a room, about the size of this room here, filled with microphones and cameras and speakers. The goal is to understand, have a system, a room where filled with sensors, the room can understand what people say, where the people are located, how, what location you're trying to move to, and to find out all the possible information you can about, including recognizing speech. There's currently about um, 35 students associated with the lab, the postdoc, graduate students, and undergrads. And most of the funding comes from Dell and Microsoft, as well as government agencies. So when we have multiple microphones, the first thing we can do is localize sound. We can find out if somebody is speaking in the room, find out exactly where that person is located. The next thing we can do is enhance. We can just try and say, we can just say we want to listen to just a single person in the room, and no matter who else talks, you cancel out the noises from any other location in space. And finally, once we have the enhanced signal and that's clean up noise, that's the noise has been removed, then we can recognize what the person said. So, let me start by sound localization. Sound localization is achieved by an array of microphones. When you speak, there's multiple microphones, your sound <coughs> waves will arrive at different microphones at different times, and with different intensities. These time, place, and intensity differences can be used to pinpoint the sound source location. By itself, sound localization has a lot of applications, uh, including smart rooms and intelligent environments. It's useful to know where people are and who in this room is talking. Automatic teleconferencing is another application where you have to steer a camera towards the speaker. And of course, in this case, you have to know what the speaker is. There's one more application, um, that of robotics, which I'll talk about at the end of my talk today. Um, I'll show you a few clips, um, media clips. But our main reason for sound localization is, of course, enhancing the sound and performing speech recognition better. Whenever I give talks, I know some people like to see more so we capture the sound, we perform some um, complicated computations according to some formulas, and we obtain the sound source location. For this talk, I thought I wouldn't discuss the uh, equations too much, but of course, if there's every question, I can go into the biggest depths into the equations if you'd like at the end. But somehow we obtain sound localizations. Let me just show you how it works. This is in a room with 24 microphones, and I was standing in the middle talking in different directions. In a 10 second recording, my lo location estimate was within five centimeters, was within five centimeter of the actual estimate. So we can very precisely, five centimeters is this much. So you can very precisely obtain where the person is speaking at, what location. On a frame by frame basis, let me show you how the estimates work. Um, and this, this is, by the way, a two dimensional map that shows my location. The red corresponds to where my location has been estimated. So you see, for most of the frames, the locations were accurate. For some, it was not. That's because the noise in that frame was more than, the, than my signal at, at any given moment. The other thing we can do is we can estimate direction. So this shows the estimated direction that I was facing based on our equations. And you can see that it reasonably works well. The project is to estimate the location and the orientation of the sound source of space using a large microphone array. So, so we can localize sound. We can localize sound pretty easily, as long as there's enough microphones and enough uh, recording and enough processing to actually localize the source. But of course our goal, this is half the problem. The remaining half the problem is to try to focus on a single location in space, the location you just found, 
and try to not listen to noise in other directions. And what people have done, there's, there's been a lot of work in uh, noise cancellation before. It actually starts in the 1960s and 70s in the US and Russia. In trying to design submarines, they have to design phased arrays to listen to, first of all, find out where the enemy subs were, and listen to them to find out what class of submarines or ship they were. So there was a lot of work done, and the Jay generally fell under this category. Using multiple microphones, we process the signal from these multiple microphones to enhance the signal intensity in one direction and reduce the signal intensity in a different direction, in, well, every other direction. This works well if you have a lot of microphones. When you have a few microphones, the gain you get, the signal to noise ratio, or SNR, gain you get is not substantial. So when people tried this for speech applications, they realized if you have two or four or eight microphones, it doesn't work that well. So for a time, for about 10 years or so, the benefit of multiple microphones wasn't really observed because the gains you would get using this technique would not be large. Our approach is, uh, it was very different. We tried to keep the signal of interest intact. <coughs> we tried to damage the noise. We tried to damage the noise so it doesn't sound like speech. And if it doesn't, the goal was if it doesn't sound like speech, hopefully it wouldn't confuse the recognition system as much. And I'll show you in a few slides what our technique sounds like versus previous work. So if you remember, this is the clean time frequency graph that I showed you before. You can observe that there is this clean shapes that in the absence of noise, in which case here there is no noise, this is very easy to detect, to find out that this shape is here, and therefore this shape is here, and therefore this person said hello. When you add noise, even if there are two microphones, the shapes from speaker one and speaker two are overlapped. Now any recognition system looking at this will have great difficulty trying to find out which shape belongs to speaker one, which shape belongs to speaker two, and in fact, what are the shapes in the first place? This is why when there's noise, recognition systems fail. One thing we're not using here is the phase. Remember a long, many, many slides ago, I mentioned that there was amplitude and frequency, which is what you just saw before, but there was also phase. Phase is something people have not used before. In fact, we realized when you have multiple microphones, phase is very useful and important. Using the phase at different times and time segments and frequencies, we can obtain a mass a masking function that cuts away regions that have noise and keeps regions that have the signal of interest. So let me show you how this works. This is the clean signal, original signal, without any noise. As soon as we add noise, these frequencies are now overlapping. Now it's very difficult to understand what this person is saying. Now we apply our mask. In essence, it's like a, almost performing surgery. We cut away regions of noise keep as much of the signal of interest intact as possible. So now, you can see that the noise, compare the original and the processed signal, the noise is gone, but our signal is slightly damaged. But hopefully the damage is not significant enough, such that this signal here is still recognizable, and the advantage is that the noise now is hopefully damaged to the point that you can't, you can't understand the noise, you can't hear the noise. So we did an experiment in a car using 56 speakers, 56 different people talking. There were two microphones, six centimeters apart, and there were two noise sources, a very noisy condition. And we tried to recognize the, the speech signal of a single source, and, try, and then we tabulated how well we could recognize using different techniques. So here is the clean signal without any noise. And in this case, the recognition rate is 95%. Not bad. Out of every 100 words, 95 would be recognized correctly. This is what it sounds like. 8, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3. And just play that again. 8, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3. Of course, when there are the two noise sources, the recognition rate drops to 7%. That means out of every 100 words, only 7 are recognized correctly, which means unless you process this somehow, it's useless. 7% is uh, almost no recognition at all. So this is what it sounds like. I went down to my locker about four and a half years, and the teacher was going to the chat room. 
it's difficult, difficult enough for us humans to recognize what the, she was saying, let alone for recognition systems. Now, using those techniques from uh, 60s and 70s that were developed for submarine detection, this is the result. Add this. Not much better. The rec because you get a SNR improvement, the, the recognition rate is slightly higher, but still it's only 25-30%, which is not good enough for almost every application. There was a researcher at MIT and also re researchers at Germany in 2001 developed a technique called post -filter. This is a technique that tries to do better, tries to do things on top of what was done using just a standard uh, SNR improvements. And this is what it sounds like. Now you can actually hear that the noise is attenuated. But you can still understand the noise. You can hear what the noise sources are saying. And the recognition rate is not that much higher. It's only 50%. Using our technique, this is what we obtain. The signal, the noise, is completely muffled, beyond perception, or almost beyond perception. And as a side effect, the signal of interest is slightly damaged. But that's a good trade-off to make, because although we damage the signal of interest, we damage the noise a lot more, and therefore our recognition rate ends up being higher. This is 73%, and in fact, we're working now to try to improve this to um, obtain a more than 90% recognition. I'll show you recordings in our lab using four microphones. There were two speakers. Speaker one is a speaker of interest saying one, two, three, four. And speaker two is a noise source saying plus uh, blue girl boy. This is what one microphone obtains. Plus blue boy girl man woman. It's very noisy. Again, using previous work, this is what we obtain when we combine the signals of four microphones, process them to get a clean signal out. Plus blue boy girl not. Man. Not a huge improvement. And again, using the technique that I showed you before, the, the time frequency masking, we obtain this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So now the noise is um, significantly reduced. And our signal of interest is uh, slightly damaged, but that's the whole point. <coughs> For recognition systems, it's much better to damage the noise significantly than to keep some of the noise around. Now, there's something very important about speech in that when you speak, you want the system to recognize your words instantaneously. It can't take 10 minutes, it can't take one hour. And therefore, our systems have to run in, on, in real time, meaning that the processor, the small processor that Palm Pilot has, you have to use to try and uh, try and get real-time speech results, which is very difficult to do. So what we're trying to do, what we've done actually, is to develop custom chips, just like graphics exploration. In all the computers you have at home, there are processors dedicated for graphics app um, applications, mostly for playing games. But um, a lot of graphics are difficult to display, therefore you have a second processor that only handles graphics. So what we've done is to create a chip that only handles speech applications. So you, you can have all the stages, including buffering, the Fourier transform, the conversion to polar <coughs> magnitude, and localization enhancement on a single chip. I have an example of it right here. A small chip that can handle all the applications that I just discussed. And now you can have a version of this for your tablet PC. Of course, Microsoft really wants to do this. They're big into the tablet PC market. And you can have a version of this for your car which would allow you to, even if there is noise, speak to your tablet PC and have it recognize your words, or speak to your car, or speak to your cell phone, or your desktop PC. In fact, this, um, this chip has resulted in a startup that a few of my former students started called Savior Technologies. And there's been 
there's been a bit, bit of media attention about some of the work that we do, including uh, attention from uh, MIT's Technology Review magazine and Scientific American. In fact, one of the applications, um, a robot application that we have that uses sound localization to move around, um, received a great deal of attention in, in the past. And I'll show you just a few clips that describe the, the robot and how it works and uh, how it uses sound to navigate. Just take a second to look. Well, this may look like a simple machine, the technology developed by a University of Toronto engineering professor will allow this robot to navigate itself around this room just by using the sound. But um, the technology is ready, so in a year or two, you have this is available. And you might see it in museums. Well, great. Well, thanks for showing us and telling us. Thanks a lot, Jay. Dr. Parham Rabi is head of the Artificial Perception Lab here at the University of Toronto. Like this one, and that will help scientists create robots that act just like you and me. From the Artificial Perception Laboratory at the University of Toronto, I'm Sharon Navarro for Cable Pulse 24. Who knows, it might have a future on Mars. Well, you are a robot, on track, and gravity is such a So as it goes from microphone to microphone, is it hearing itself as well as speaking? Is there kind of an interaction? And it hears itself, but not beyond what microphone with the microphones that are in the room. So in essence, its ears are throughout the room. It's uh, combined uh, in sync with the entire sensors we have in the room. Here, you can see our primary microphone array, which allows me to localize myself based on the localization results that you see on the computer screen. So looking at this wall then, you've got all these little microphones set up. Yes. So as this robot comes along, bit by bit by bit, yes. it's being directed each each step of the way. Exactly. Every step that it takes, every distance that it moves, is based on a lot of calculations on this. So, the point of my talk was that using multiple microphones is a good idea. There's a lot of things we can do, including localization and enhancement. And we simply can't do with a single microphone. And if we do use multiple microphones, we can eventually have speech recognition in a lot of places, such as cars, homes, computers. There are two issues that I won't discuss because there isn't enough time and I know everybody's tired, so, um, but I'll just briefly mention them. What is, what happens when in most environments you don't have a microphone? In this room, we don't have a microphone already, but yet we do. I'm sure most of you have cell phones, and if so, somehow these cell phones could be combined, synchronized, and integrated, we would have a very large microphone. Now, one of my uh, students, uh, Omid Jack Romi, is working on ideas to, um, integrate multiple cell phones. So even if one is in your pocket, even if one is off or on, and if they have unknown positions, how do you find them, combine them, and use them? And so that's what he's working on. The other application is, which I didn't talk about at all, is cameras. If you had a camera on a person's mouse, let's say if there was a camera on this palm pilot looking at me as I spoke, you could do things like liberty. Based on the lip movements, no matter how much noise is in the environment, you can find out my lip motions, and based on those, get a better idea of what the, what the words that I'm speaking are. And in fact, combining multiple cameras and multiple microphones is a very interesting extension, which um, I, again, uh, don't have time to talk about. But if you're interested in any of these topics, uh, please have a look at uh, my website, or from my lab's website, or pick up one of these brochures, which I have up here. The website is www.apl.utronto.ca. So have a look. And, and that's it. I'll keep the talk today very short. Thank you very much. For
در لحظه من خواهش میخورم که آقای زاری تشکیل اینجا یک مراسم کوشیکی هست که اجرا بکنم بعد در این فاصله اصلا که گفتان شروع این فرما خدمت داده میشه هر کس که سوالی داره استفاده بکنه بریزن و در آقای کامیاب خدمت بکنه در اینجا شما سوالی باشه بزن بکنه که ما از طرف شما بازی حرفه در صورت نوشته تا یک از این که تقدیم پروفیسور عرابی عزیز رو کنیم من میخوام در اینجا بعد از این از همکار عزیزم و خانه مهندس درشتان صدا خواهم کردیم بعد برای اطلاع شما بخونن قبل از این میخوام از مادر گرامی آقای دکتر و عربی ارجمند شون آقای مهندس که من سرابی که خود از ارزای قدیمی خانه هستند استدعا کنند اونجا تشریف بیارند از طرف این کانون این حدیه را به فرزند برومند شده این فرزند ایران فرزند همه افتخار آفرین را ما تخلیم کنیم استان کنم سرکار خانون
گرداننده این برنامه یا مدیر اصلاح تایم کیپینگ این برنامه خانم مهندس رشتیان هستن فرما را اگر شما در این بیت کام داشتیم هم خواهیم کنند که شروع بفرمایید اصلاحی رو اعلام بفرمایید در آقای دکتر خانم مریم Taking care of sensor fusion battery localization. Now, battery sensor fusion. We should have some sensor sensors that are going to be used. Now, fusion. Tapping. Initially, we take all the signals and we use it to localize the source. Once we know the source location, then we can combine the signals in a way. For example, I showed you in a few slides back. We can use multiple microphones. So the masks that I showed you, those are actually fused masks. They're masks obtained not from a single microphone, but from the many microphones. In that case, too, of course, the more you have, the better it works. Is this a specific technique like neural network or something like that? Yeah, it's something. Um, have you all tried to incorporate uh, this technology with uh, artificial intelligence to uh, do the online processing for cars? And okay, the question is, have you combined this with uh, artificial intelligence for cars? Now, speech recognition, uh, so what I showed you is the localization and enhanced. And I just said, it goes to the recognition system, the recognition system works well. The recognition system is very complicated. It has an initial um, vowel detection. It finds out not what words you speak, but what vowels you speak. Based on these vowels, it then tries to find out in a probabilistic way, using AI, artificial intelligence, what word you spoke. Now, it doesn't stop there. Now, you, let's say there are four words that you spoke. You're not going to generate words randomly. There's a sentence you're trying to speak. And therefore, there has to be a grammar model that you have. In English, you in Farsi. It, it tries to find out the, the grammar model and find out what the words are, the most likely words are. And in fact, all of those stages are based on AI techniques. Yeah, now, I, I was more interested in the learning aspects of the AI yes. incorporated into your system. So what? that... That detection of so those that words... So that learning system could be used to cut off noise. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. So a different, completely different approach to this is to Try and understand that there is a noise source that's speaking. Learn it, understand it, and try the same thing with the second person talking. You can do that, but not with the processors behind it. In fact, I have a student working on that exact same problem you mentioned. It works, surprisingly, it doesn't work as well as this. And for a single phrase, it takes six days on 10 Pentium 4s for it to process. It may be a very fruitful idea, but not today. But we'll do research on it. Maybe one. So the gamings, doctor. My name is uh, David Farmani. Uh, I have congratulated you for your accomplishment. Uh, uh, it's really uh, give us more reason to participate uh, to see this. Uh, scholarship program uh, get uh, popular in uh, Mohandas. Uh, my question is, uh, does your project is looking at integrating number of microphones and invite them to participate um, as noise level increases and commission those microphones as noise level drops or so increases? Don't, so have them stand by Rephrasing what you said, if you have 200 microphones and you use all of them, it takes too long. But um, use them when you need them. So pick the best microphones, say, in any room, there might be 200 microphones. Pick 10 best ones if the situation works. And if it's really bad, then you use 100 microphones. In fact, that's one of the things, a lot of the work that we do is, these things are getting old. So some of the new things we do is, in fact, exactly what you mentioned. Um, instead of trying to just uh, use more processes, Try to find an intelligent way of picking the most useful microphones, and the numbers could be different. Once you might need two, another time you might need a hundred. And so pick the best number of microphones and use those. And in fact, the answer is yes, we do. Thank you. 
Sound attenuates as the distance increases uh, and therefore as time increases, it attenuates with a time or distance square. So uh, after uh, a few seconds, so we can imagine how long it takes for the sound to go around the Earth and we can imagine how much attenuation experiences. And therefore that is, unfortunately, uh, is going to be uh, impossible. Do you know of any other application that can uh, that you can use your technique, like say the doctor on the ministry or ministry for measuring turbulence noise or so multi-sensor techniques using our our techniques. There might be other applications. I don't know. You haven't. I haven't explored that. There are applications in medical imaging for um, ultrasound for for medical imaging. There could be some interesting applications which we're collaborating with um, a few professors in medicine. But um, I, I have no results to show you, therefore I won't, won't make any conclusions in that. There could be, you're absolutely right. There could be many applications potentially. The caption that we are now having in TVs and for news and program, what uh, technology do you In most cases, if there's a human operator, there's somebody that sits there and listens to the programs and describes them. Um, in some cases, they get dialogues directly from the television show. Um, and in some instances, they've tried to use speech recognition systems. But in most cases, speech recognition will not work. Because on TV, you have notes. You might have multiple people talking at the same time. You might have people um, laughing in the background in, in, on TV. And therefore, speech recognition in those cases will not work. First year then. <laughs> Question: Are you going later having a library of different accents, for example, to be recognizable by by computer? What you can do with accents, because you can, you know, get rid of the noise. Yes. When we're talking so about that's how a different, different problem. Are. That's when you have no noise, but somebody that has an accent. Yeah. It actually is not a significant problem. Every time we speak, we speak differently. Somebody could actually we may not have accents at all, but our speech is different. That's why every recognition system has to be trained. They have to be trained exactly as to person X, exactly how does person X speak. So that's why that initial training is required. And therefore, accents would be trained upon and wouldn't generally be a problem. Now the problem is when people speak differently as they talk. And when they say the same words again and again, but at different times, in different ways, and that's a problem. Question? I was wondering how cost effective is your technique compared to other approaches? and how close you are to commercialize your technique? Good, good question. Cost effective, you mean in the sense of uh, how much does it cost, right? Not the <clears throat> computational aspect of it. So as I said, there's a company that's formed around this, and we're actually starting to build the prototypes. Uh, in terms of costs, the prototype's a little expensive, but we're hoping this chip, once mass manufactured, this will cost about $2. The microphones themselves will be about $3. So you'll have a small device in your car or your TV or your home or anywhere else. And it'll cost you about $5. That's the original goal. So not that expensive when you look at the price of the car. How close you are to commercialize you know, your technique? We have a system demo that works today. Uh, in terms of a commercial application, we're hoping in two years for this to be in the market. At least that's what we told the investors. So those questions back there. Normally, this uh, speech recognition system works uh, based on different words we use. Yeah. Right. So, uh, in terms of the question, the other question uh, somebody had out uh, there, different accents uh, totally uh, makes different uh, way for okay. The shapes that I showed you before, different accents would produce different shapes. 
uh, what's the technique just to, um, uh, you know, just for the system to recognize this different way where are exactly pointing to the certain work we are expecting the system to do? So you're saying, can we have a system that um, has been trained on different accents? And not necessarily the accent, but even uh, some people by mistake you uh, put the stress on different parts of the work, you know? Yes, so in, if the system, if, if the person speaks more or less the same, always, the system will train, find out what, um, there's always, what, for example, if you use any recognition system, you have to read phrases initially. That's what's doing the training. And therefore, the words that you speak, it finds out how you speak what shapes in time frequency you produce, and therefore what words they correspond to. Now, if you speak differently, if you now introduce a different accent to the system, two things can happen. The first thing is that the accent that is not bad, the difference is not huge, and therefore, when the system tries to match it to a word, it's pretty close to the original, and therefore it gets the word right. Now, if the word you speak is very different than what was trained upon, the system will be confused and it will get the wrong word. <coughs> In the back. Hi. Yeah, so I was just wondering, have you conducted any field tests, for example, to so like check the in a car or TV in someone's home, for example? The yes. recognition results I showed you were all in a car. Are you going to conduct more of this and like someone that doesn't know the system is there and knows anything in the background? Because when you're testing it, someone who has something to do with the project, it's a no. The 56 speakers we used were, uh, were not people who created the system. Right. And that's important. Your experiment has to be um, correctly done. Because if you implement this in a car, someone might say, well, this might be dangerous. On a cell phone or on a PDA, it's easy. There isn't that many approval processes. On a car, it's substantially hard. Uh, there's a, many different stages that you have to go through to get approved. And there's different organizations, there's different certification boards that you have to go through. There's a um, yeah, Canadian Auto Safety Certification Board that you have to go through. And there's international ones as well. We don't only want to sell this in Canada, so what we've done, we've gone to international boards, and there's many of them, and in fact, um, we talk to the CEO of the company, who has a huge list that he still has to go to. Yes? Instead of using different microphones, multiple microphones, can you have one microphone with different angles, or moving in different angles to get the same one? Yeah, you have a microphone that's moving? No, oh, just different angles, just target to different angles. They're moving, yeah. So the microphone is at, at different angles? Yeah. And one, only one. Depends if it's a directional microphone or an omnidirectional microphone. Which means, does your microphone listen to every direction, which in that case is not very useful, or does it only listen to a single direction? If it's a microphone that only listens to a single direction, and you have thousands of these in every possible direction, that could potentially be very useful. But that would be very expensive because you need a lot of money. When you have two microphones, you can steer them in the sense that you can delay them and do signal processing when they're far apart. Just listen to different directions yourself. Therefore, you only need two microphones and a processor. But if you have microphones at different angles, you need a very large number. Can you not combine two of them to find the angle? Absolutely. You combine directional and omnidirectional microphones. That's definitely possible. Thank you, Sir.